I often get asked to talk about the future. The Google man comes to talk about the future. And um, often people like that because it gives them a kind of a day off from the normal stuff they do. And they go and hear about the future. And they might go home and talk to their kids because they heard about the future today. And then the next day, they go back to work. And they go back to the present. And they don't do anything differently. OK. So therefore. I'm actually going to challenge that now, because you heard some presentations this morning about the future too. But for me, what I'm going to say is actually the future is now. We are actually living in the future right now. Now, some of you might be a bit confused by that, but I'm now actually going to give you a proof point to prove that we actually are living right in the future. And this little video clip hopefully will help that. Some of you might uh, recognize it. Where are you going? About 30 years. So the film, Back to the Future. When they went to the future, what year was it? It was today. So we are living in the future, 2015, okay? If you need more proof that you're actually today in the future, remember they had a hoverboard in the, uh, the film. They had the hoverboard. The hoverboard has been invented, okay? So we are in the future right now. They also had self-tying uh, basketball boots. Power laces, all right. Nike has developed the basketball uh, shoe that now can sense your feet and tighten accordingly. So we are in the future. Okay? The future is very much now. Um, the future is driven by technological um, advances. And some of these technological advances are amazing and give loads and loads of benefits. So this, for instance, is, I don't know if you've seen this, is the contact lens that we've developed uh, that can take your blood sugar levels. So anyone who's diabetic who forever had to kind of take blood from the end of their fingers and desensitize the end of their fingers, now this contact lens can, uh, can take the readings automatically in a little chip in a contact lens. And we're developing this now hand in hand with Novartis. So technology can bring you uh, wonderful things. Um, technology can bring you things that you're not so sure whether they're so wonderful or not. You can make your own judgment on that one. Um, the rapid rise in technology also gives us other stuff that might make us go, ugh. That's not so nice, that one. Um, and some of us might think, actually, is that just wrong? And make us feel slightly uncomfortable. But unfortunately, it's um, whatever we think of it, it's, it's here to stay. Um, now, a couple of people in the audience I know have seen this before. So don't shout out, but it's kind of quiz questions to see if you're um, up to speed after lunch. So to demonstrate how quickly this technological change is accelerating, we're going to work out how long did it take for each of these medias to get to 50 million users? OK? So first one, the telephone. How long did it take for the telephone to get to 50 million people using it? What do you reckon? 50 years? 50 years? It actually was 75 years. So it took 75 years for the telephone to get to 50 million users. The next one is the radio. The radio, how long do you reckon the radio was? 20, someone said? Any advances? 20, 20, 38. So it took 38 years for the radio to get to 50 million users. Next one is the television. What do you reckon? There's obviously a theme coming here, if you kind of got that, yeah? Um, eight, eight? 15? 13, pretty close there. So 13 years. And this kind of funny symbol here is the World Wide Web. So how long, you can, unsurprising the man from Google is going to say it's going to be quite quick. So how long did it take the web to get 50 million users? 
three, two, it's actually four years. Okay, four years. Um, I always say when I present this is the most important stat of the day, not that one, but the one that's about to follow. So people taking notes, make sure you note this one down. Um, how long did it take Angry Birds <laughs> to get to 50 million users? 35 days, okay? Frightening. Things are moving really, really, really fast. Um, and why are they moving really, really fast? Uh, connectivity. More and more homes are having broadband connectivity. Uh, if you've moved from kind of snail internet to fiber internet, you will understand the change that makes. I live in a little village in Oxfordshire, and we now have fiber internet. It's unbelievable going from kind of five to 80. It's unbelievable the changes that you can, uh, in terms of downloading films, whatever it might be, the change that it brings to your life. And that's going to be rolled out right across Europe over the next number of years. And that changes how people connect to the internet. Equally, 4G, um, whilst I have you know, we're saying we've got 80% coverage by 2019. They're going to have to pull their finger out of my village. I'm not sure I've got 1G, let alone 4G. Um, but 4G, more and more cities are covered by 4G. EE, I think, says they've got 80% of the UK already covered by 4G. Completely changes the way um, that consumers are connected, and they can do more and more with the devices in their pocket. And this pace of change is going to get faster and faster and faster. In fact, today is the slowest rate of technological change that we, you will go through for the rest of your lives. Okay? So today is the slowest it will be. So if you're already feeling giddy today, reach for the sick bags because it's only going to get quicker and quicker and quicker. Um, some people love this stuff. Um, we saw some of these type of companies presented earlier. Uh, people who love the disruption and the opportunities created by technology moving really, really quick. So all these companies uh, on the screen here uh, weren't around five or six years ago. Okay, young, agile startups, technologically based, can come up from nowhere. That wouldn't have been possible 20, 30 years ago for people to, to scale so very, very quickly. Okay, they have no fear and they're using technology to grow their businesses very, very fast. Now, Finance is uh, no different. Um, finance is, is using technology, and there's some examples here on the screen. Um, we've already had a presentation about Poland today, and that the top left is actually a, a Polish uh, ATM that uses the veins on your fingers to withdraw money. So if a Polish criminal tries to chop your finger off, you're going to be poor. But um, that's how they can use technology to get an ATM, no need for a card. Uh, that's one of the UK building societies with a smart watch, uh, with a chat with an Apple. Uh, you, you can probably already get into your bank account via your Apple Watch. You've got smart payments by the wristband there. And rather curiously, this, I think this is Mitsubishi Bank in, the, uh, in Japan, have a robot working in the bank to meet and greet and ask questions of uh, people entering the bank. They've got one of those in my bank in Banbury, and her name's Brenda. But anyway... Um, Ooh, sorry. Okay, so you've got all these gizmos, and they're kind of all, all, all great, but um, what are you guys doing? And in the auto finance world, this is um, often the position that's adopted. Um, it's a bit harsh and a bit challenging, but I'm going to say it's automotive is a really, and I'm part of the problem, I've spent most of my time in automotive, is um, really status quo driven, um, manufacturing based, really, really slow, risk averse business. And then you add finance on top of that, and you, that's a real kind of recipe for risk adversity. And if you adopt this position, your business will fail, and you'll get sand in your ears, neither of which are pleasant. So please um, don't do this. Now, the automotive consumer is um, now constantly connected, but not constantly connected through one device. It's constantly connected now through six devices at least. Uh, we've got the desktop, which we obviously have known and loved for quite a while. Uh, mobile, tablet, connected TVs. Increasingly, your TV at home is connected to the internet. And also, the controls for that are getting easier and easier to use. We've already talked about wearables. And also, we've touched upon the fact that your cars uh, are going to be connected to um, the consumer and connected to yourselves. And how does that change behavior? We're already seeing uh, car buyers using cross-device to choose their cars. So here's some stats. These will, quite frankly, be 
every time I update them will be out of date immediately because uh, smartphone is growing over and over every day. But you can see there they're using all devices to choose their car and the growth comes in smartphone. So desktop actually from um, a searches on car finance is actually going down. Okay. So if you don't have a mobile site that doesn't that works properly, your business is buggered. Okay. So if you get bored of me, look at your mobile site, and if you have to pinch and squint and do it with your little tiny finger like that, your business is going to fail. You need to go mobile. Mobile is what's growing. Desktop is on the way down. You have to go mobile. I'm going to really bang that home. Equally, from consumers and banking purposes, they're going between devices as well. So when people are using their banking, they're going to use all devices when they interact with their bank. And when they're using devices, we're constantly connected in our pockets. That doesn't stop when they get to the dealership. So if any of you guys run dealerships, they're using your free Wi-Fi to shop you. Okay. So when they go to the dealership, they are going to shop you on your car prices. They're going to shop you on your finance. Okay. You can see that whichever way. If you want to be risk averse, you can say that's a threat. If you see that's an opportunity, if they're on your competitor's site, that's an opportunity for you to be found and actually get them off that forecourt onto your forecourt. But consumer is constantly connected and constantly shopping all the time. And that's only set to continue. This stat here is how many mobile phone users will have used their phone for banking uh, by the end of the decade, huge number. So we, we say the consumer is constantly connected. We've all got lots of devices. Everyone in the room has got at least one phone. Um, when I worked in the Middle East, everyone seemed to have a phone for every wife, so a number of phones each. Um, I'm not going to count your phones on the table right now. Um, but we've got all these phones and we're constantly connected, but actually the consumer is more open-minded than ever. You know, we say he's got all the gear but no idea. 80% of consumers, when they start their journey for a car, don't know what make and model they want to buy. So massively open-minded. And I, I passionately believe that finance has an enormous role to play in helping the consumer make that choice about what is possible for them to purchase. So the first thing you've got to do is make sure that you can be found. Yeah? What you're trying to sell to the consumer, can they find that when they're searching for you? So when they type into a search engine called Google, other search engines are available, they're not very good, so use this one. <laughs> they, um, are they going to find you, and are they going to come up with a site that's vaguely engaged and looking? I put this just to prompt everyone else in the room to see, so let's go, can I go backwards? So therefore, you know, how are you showing? Are you showing at the top? Is it an advert that's going to be clickable? When you click through, is it a good site that goes to? Equally, and possibly even more importantly now, does exactly the same happen on mobile? Yeah? Clearly, there's more positions to be seen on mobile, so even more important than you're on the top. And also, the website that it goes to thereafter is actually enabled for mobile. Now, our algorithms change. But actually, if your site doesn't work on mobile, it won't show very well in the rankings at all because we'll penalize you massively because the website isn't mobile enabled. Okay, so you have to show and be found. Equally, when someone has found you, you need to listen to them. Okay, they've come looking, they've gone around your website. Have you actually listened to what they've said when they've been on your website? They're leaving a trail of clues around your website with their behavior. Have you listened? Are you collecting the cookies? Are you having a conversation with them? Yeah. The story I always tell at this stage is, no, it's like someone going into a car showroom yeah, one day, new user after sales, so I'm here for after sales, so going over to uh, after sales, having a conversation about buying some spark plugs, da 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 coming in the next day, they remind you, uh, they remember you and go, right, sir, so straight over to see the spark plugs. Yeah? They wouldn't go through the whole rigmarole again. Your websites, or most car manufacturers' websites and dealer websites, greet you every time like they've never seen you before because they're not remembering what you've already told them. Okay? So remember the things that the customer is saying along the journey right across the web on your website and all the platforms. Are you listening to what they're saying so therefore you can put relevant stuff in front of them next time you find them on the web? That's really, really important. Uh, many car buyers change their minds. So we said as they're going through this process, they're open-minded, but the choice they might have had at first in their mind at the beginning, they're often willing to have their eyes changed to someone else. Okay? And often finance would play an important role in that because actually the consumer will go, actually, 
I never knew I could get one of those for that monthly payment. I never knew the residuals on that were so good. If only you actually showed them that. Usually that kind of finance is deep, deep within the website. Is it really coming up in front of them saying, actually, this car might be cheaper than you might have perceived, and therefore people can switch brands? Then you also can be inspirational. And you go, well, how can car finance be inspirational? It's as dull as ditch water. No, it can be inspirational. You really need to be inspirational. Uh, one of the ways um, to be inspiring is, is using video. Um, I think... I say a minute's worth of video is worth 1.2 million words, I think is, is the calculation. Um, it's massively, massively powerful. It works to all the senses. Uh, and we, our research shows that at least 75% of car buyers are going to use online video next time round when they're researching their car purchase. So um, how can you make um, car finance or banking or finance generally um, slightly compelling? Uh, I've got an example here from TD Bank in, in, the, in the Americas. And a video I'm going to show you here is, uh, well, I'll let it speak for itself. Hello there. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I'm here to thank you. You're welcome. Hi, Christine. Bonjour, Kevin. Bonjour. Hi, Michael. Hi. I'm ATM. You know what ATM stands for? Automated teller machine. That is correct, normally, but today you're wrong. I'm an automated thanking machine. Hey, look at that, buddy. <laughs> That's for you. That's on TV Canada Trust. Thank you. Selfie. Get my good side. There's a slot that's opening. Oh up. my goodness. Never in all my life had such a beautiful surprise. Yeah, you've been uh, helping your daughter out, is that correct? Yes. We've got something for you, Christine. We, there's something that's about to come out there. Those are two piggy banks. Those are for your kids. Well, we've got a little something for you because you're a famous customer. We know you love the Jays so much. Look on the other side of me. There's another slot. It's going to open up. <laughs> on the left side there, yeah. That's awesome! She's my only daughter. She has cancer and she had uh, an operation on Tuesday. We wanted to thank you in a very specialized way. There's actually a card coming out for you right there. And if you look inside each piggy bank, there's a check for $1,000 to start an RESP for each of your kids. Yay! Yes! Yeah, right. that outfit. <laughs> Well, the thanking's not done, Christy. What? Anyway, you, you get, you're all engaged with it. You're all watching it. The most important point here is that 20.6 20, 20. million people have also sat and watched this video already. And it's about a bank. Okay? So you can be compelling. It's a simple idea, but 20.6 million people have watched this about the bank. Clearly, everyone who's watched it, they also have on a cookie list that they can go back and show other videos and be more and more engaged with them. So a really, really simple idea. So finance can be engaging. Um, how else can we be engaging? Make it as easy as possible for the consumer to make your choice. We remember, I've already said that the consumer is massively open-minded. Yeah? If I'm talking to... OEMs, manufacturers, I would say largely their websites are redundant unless you've already chosen to buy that brand. Yeah. If I've chosen I want to buy a BMW, the BMW website's helpful. If I haven't chosen what brand I want to buy, the BMW website doesn't help me at all. And actually, I'm not singling them out. I could go for all manufacturers, virtually. They don't help it at all. Now, Hyundai here make it have had a reasonable attempt here because at least on the top of their website is a section where I can actually... Um, talk to them in kind of normal terms without knowing the Hyundai um, lineup off by heart because I can tell them how much I want to spend, et cetera, et cetera. It's interesting to note that actually I'd like to spend is actually in total value as opposed to monthly payment. It does switch to monthly payment if you're, say, a business user, but I suspect that Hyundai spent put more of their retail sales through finance on monthly payments than they do, yeah? So why isn't that monthly payment? I'm not looking at anyone. Okay, but it's good, but it's good. I'm not having a go because actually this is better than most, better than most. The other, the other example that I would pick up on is um, Motors, the, the aggregator 
the used car aggregator. And I think they do a good job in here because when I'm looking for a car and I'm open-minded, I don't know what I need. But if you try them out, it's quite good because you can say, actually, I know I've got a dog. I know I want to carry six people. I know I like the color blue. And I know I want to drive as fast as a cheetah. Okay? And then they'll find me the cars that fit that criteria. I just think that's really, really helpful. And if actually finance comes to play better in these spaces as well, that's really, really useful in making it easy for the customer. Um, an example here that I often kind of pick on is, uh, people heard of Carvana in the US. Um, Carvana is a, an online uh, site that sells cars online. There's no store. Okay, the only store actually is like a dispensing machine for cars that when you actually bought the car, you can kind of pick it up from these garages. Um, I'm not saying here that cars should be sold online. That's not my point at all. Uh, but I think it's a, a website worth visiting. Um, and the bit that I want to pick out and why I've pulled on them today is I just love their finance calculator. I like their finance calculator because it's kind of engaging. It's more interesting than the average finance calculator. So. I can play with it, and it looks like a car speedo, obviously, and I can play with my monthly payment, and the dials go up and down. Now, clearly, you've got the standard thing that that's calling, but it's just a bit more exciting. Yeah? You're making finance more exciting. Finance has gone sexy. Yeah? Really simple thing, but just be more engaging for the customer. And they will stick on your site for longer, and they're more likely to convert with you. Yeah? It doesn't have to be really dull and transactional. You can bring it to life. And equally, every time, it's got to work on mobile. It's got to work on mobile. Let me flick on. Um, equally, finance is sometimes really, really complicated. I was chatting to someone um, uh, just for lunch about a, a colleague in the office who just bought a car. And he goes, I thought PCP was a drug. Um, <laughs> and, and then I had to kind of look into actually what it was in terms of a, a financing mechanism. So therefore, he ended up finding videos about actually what PCPs were. But largely, he didn't find those on the manufacturer's site. He found those on the independent sites. So if you're a manufacturer, you're allowing your customers to go away from you to find out what the heck you're talking about on your site. So try and explain what all these products are. We're massively internally referenced in the industry. We perceive that everyone speaks the same language as us. But they don't. They don't understand what all these mechanisms mean. Yeah? And they seem very frightening. Make them come to life. Talk them in, in real language. And then I would say, use video to bring that to life. Use cartoon, whatever it might be. Uh, explain what contract are, what lease purchase is. Explain what all these things are, and people might actually use them and feel warmer about your brand because you've explained it to them. And also be aware that when you're doing your marketing, be what we call always on. Okay? Whilst registrations go up and down, the consumer is always in market. The consumer is always researching. The average um, research time for a new car, we think, is about three months. Um, so they're going to be always searching. The only day that the consumer takes off is Christmas Day. That's Christmas Day. Okay? And straight after the Queen, they, go back, they, they unwrap the mobile phone and they get back on search again. It honestly goes straight back up. You can see that line straight back up again. So these are car finance search searches, contract hire searches, car lease searches, car loan searches, uh, finance car searches. You can see they're virtually flat. All the way through, it's just that drop on Christmas Day. So the consumer's always out there. So lots of people make the mistake of saying, right, I'm going to put all my money in September and March, because that's when all the registrations happen. That's when all the registrations happen, and it's way too late, because the registrations are happening. The decisions have happened way, way before that. So make sure you're always on. Be there at the moment that matters for the consumer, which could be right throughout the year. So, so I'm just going to give you a couple of top tips. You saw a flash of the first one there. Top tips, in my view, of um, the kind of cultural change that needs to happen if you're not going to be kind of left behind by all these disruptors that are kind of nibbling at your bits of the business. And as um, a more established industry, how are we going to be successful in this, um, this age that's dominated by technological fast-moving change? How, how can the, uh, the car industry and the finance industry be successful? And the first one is... Um, taking more risks, which is ironic from the Experian presentation earlier. Um, but you've got to take more risks. I'm not talking about credit risks here. I'm just taking risks in your business. What I mean by risk is doing something differently than you've done before. Yeah? Carrying on what you've always done for the last 20 years isn't going to work. Okay? It's just not going to work. And 
importantly, that's kind of removing the fear of failure in your organizations. So therefore, I often speak to kind of senior guys in organizations say, yeah, we want to do things differently, we want things differently. But actually, they've got a success culture in their company that is so strong that it scares the living daylights out of the people more junior in the organization who actually do the work to actually trying anything new and trying to be innovative. Okay. So remove that fear of failure in your organization. Um, at Google, we're obsessed with failing. Uh, we challenge ourselves if we don't fail enough. Um, because if we're not failing, our targets must be too low. Okay. You must fail. Fail quickly and learn from your failures. failures but if, if you never fail, your targets are too low. You're not stretching yourself enough. Uh, the next one is, is wising up. We've heard a lot about um, big data today. And you've got to make better and better use of the data. And as, uh, in the finance world, we have tons and tons and tons of data. This is actually a picture of one of our data centers. And we've got them scattered all around the world. And um, there's quite a bit of data out there. Uh, in fact, in the last two days, there's been more data created than from the beginning of time till the end of 2003. Okay. The technical term is shitloads of data. Okay, there's just a lot of data out there. So, um, th and the challenge is there is lots and lots of data, but big data is no use whatsoever. Okay, big data is you want little data. Okay, no one can consume big data. So the skill is taking that data and interpreting it and doing something about it. Okay, so collect it in the first place. But you guys, I'm sure you have tons and tons of data half of which you're probably not actually doing anything about. And, and the, uh, the, uh, the famous phrase on this I love is, data makes your briefcase heavy, insights make you rich. Okay, So having a huge pile of data on your desk is not really going to help. You've got to make sure you crunch through that data and say, hmm, what's that telling me? What's that telling me? What clues is that giving me in my business? What should I do as a result of doing that? Okay. So insights are the key from that data. And lastly, everything you do, you've got to do quicker than you've ever done it before. You've just got to challenge yourself to speed up. The world is moving so much quicker than it ever does, has before. Now, in truth, what you're not trying to do is keep up with your competition. Don't try and keep up with your competition. Because that's the wrong benchmark. The thing you have to keep up with is the consumer. The consumer is way, way ahead of the competition. Yeah. You've got to keep up with the consumer. That's crucial. So we're a bit like Felix Baumgartner, standing on the edge, waiting to jump off. And the question you've got to ask yourselves, who's going to be first to the future? Thank you very much indeed. Okay. Right. A direct assault on the industry in many ways in terms of traditional thinking. Any questions for, for you here? Or insults back. Or insults back. <laughs> can, it, can, can the industry do it? Is it prepared to change in that, in that respect? No questions. I have a question. Can I have a roving mic, please? <laughs> Ah, we're on. Brilliant. It's okay. We're on. Uh, I have a question. Just before you came up, we were having a chat about um, uh, the industry's websites, and you've been onto a number of websites, and you had a look, and you were talking about the fact that the websites you'd looked at seem to be organized in sort of internal silos. It'd be interesting yeah, well, for you to, uh, had a to expand on that. Yeah, a conversation. Well, <clears throat> go, those who look at, for manufacturers, well, go look at your company website, and actually, is it a consumer-facing website? Or is it your organogram? Yeah? So if you, is it actually customer focused? Is it set up in the way that a consumer is actually going to do business with you? Or actually, are all the tabs and all the drop downs different departments within your businesses that the consumer doesn't care about? But that's how you've organized your website. I think lots of businesses are making it really hard to do business with them. So you've got to take off your internal customer glasses and put on those consumer glasses and say, let's be a consumer for the day. 
And the great thing about working in the auto industry, because I enjoyed it for a long time, is we got free cars and we never paid for them. So we actually never bought one and we never actually experienced buying one. And it's odd when you've come out of the industry and you have to buy a car and go through the process yourself. And that's a little bit of an eye opener. So I think I would say it's, it's hard and I appreciate because I've been in it to kind of step back and look of how you are expressing yourself digitally in front of a consumer and say, actually, is it built for the consumer or is it built for my organization? And I suppose the example of that is where you go onto a manufacturer's website and you'll, look at a, you'll click and you'll have a look at a whole load of stuff about cars. And then if you want finance, you go finance back to the home page, you click and you go back to that. And if you want something about insurance, you click and you go back to that. And after sales, you click and you yeah, go back to that. Insurance is kind of that tab, then drop down, and then that tab yeah. and that tab and that tab. Thank you. Yeah, we have another question over here. Graham. Hello, Graham Hill. Um, it concerns me greatly with historical information that's held on the internet. People carry out research. And for example, there's a couple of uh, examples, money saving expert. People put their advice on there, which could be five, six, seven, eight years old now. And it's not current. Mm -hmm. What should you be doing to make sure that information that's stored, or what should the industry be doing, or how should we be approaching this to ensure that when people are doing their research on the internet, the research that they're carrying out is current, and it's not out of date or illegal? Um, yeah, I think the fact is you've got to put it out there in fresh and easily found form, quite frankly. If there's five years old data that's appearing in search, it's because that's where most people have been going, and the stuff that's been there more recently is not being compelling and interesting and found. So the question is, is the alternative out there? So from my point of view, you've got to be really, really frequent in what time you're refreshing. You've got to make it really, really easy for it to be found. And I'm not just talking about pay, paid ads. That's not, I'm not here flogging Google paid ads, but that kind of helps. But um, it's for fact is, is your website built in such a compelling way that you're organically it's naturally going to rise to the top? And sometimes these ones that have been out for five years have been so popular, they're going to rise for a while. But if actually new stuff comes in there, it does get knocked down. It does get knocked down. You just got to be fresh. You just got to publish lots of stuff and make it really easy formats and put it in mobile form because the stuff that's out there five years, I guarantee it's not in mobile form. Oh, mine's up to date. Oh, my blog is always up to date. And it works perfectly on a mobile? <laughs> it works perfectly on a mobile. Well done. Perfect. Good. No question? Over here. Gordon. Hugh, can I ask a terribly pedestrian question? The, the move to mobiles. Um, that the emphasis that Google has put on mobiles, there's a lot of people selling the concept of responsive websites. Is it essential to have a responsive website or can you have a website that just looks right on a mobile phone? How does Google view that? Um, you can do it either way as long as it works on a mobile phone. It depends what it's right for your business. Some people have a desktop website, a tablet website, and a mobile website, and people have responsive. I guess responsive in many ways is the most economic because you don't have to kind of redo it every time. But some organizations choose to have a mobile-specific website. Uh, the key thing is, does it work on mobile? I find the most cost-effective route for your particular business in doing that. But the challenge is just act as a consumer. And I've got big fat fingers like most of us. I don't have fingers of a Cindy doll. You know, can you do it? And just make it, it's just really simple things you can do. So for instance, finance involves a lot of numbers. So if you're filling in something, when you're asking for a field input that requires numbers, does the keyboard change to the number keyboard? That's just a piece of programming. It's a really, really simple thing to do. But how many times do you go through a website and it asks for a telephone number and it's still got the ABCs in front of you and you have to kind of switch to numbers? Just little tiny touches like that to make it as easy as possible to work on mobile. That's, just, that's a tiny, tiny little example. Yeah. But there's some real kind of simple rules of running on mobile. But responsive, I think, is a kind of great idea because it works on all platforms and all different sizes of screens. Because whilst we talk about mobile phones, mobile phones seem to be kind of getting bigger and bigger. I don't know where a phone stops, a phablet begins, and a tablet emerges. I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure about that. that's a kind of waffly answer to your question. But as long as it works so, on mobile, so mobile like it. So responsive is not the be-all and end-all. It's not. Well, from our Absolutely point of view, we required. just want it to work on a mobile. So therefore, we'll, we'll measure if it, it works and the consumer will work by it. You know, the way the algorithm works is customer clicked on search, went to the website, unhung around a bit. 
If they go to your website and don't hang around a bit and bounce back, we'll go, well, actually, the consumer doesn't like that very much and penalise you accordingly. Or reward you if it's a great experience and they stick around. That's as simple as that. Is that okay, Gordon? Thank you very much. Any, one more? One more final question? Don't often get a chance to um, have a word with someone from Google Automotive. Okay. Good. Hugh, thank you very much. That was absolutely Good. excellent. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.